I'm very lucky to have done something I love for so long and scraped a living. <laughs> Welcome to Hack Circus. This week I meet Simon Munnery, who is somebody I've been a fan of since I was a child and have seen live many times but have never actually met and spoken to. So it was just an absolute joy to meet him and chat to him for this podcast. And really I should be thanking you for giving me an excuse to meet these people and have these great conversations. If you don't know who Simon is, he's generally considered one of the most original and creative performers on the comedy circuit. He does uh, character comedy and stand-up, often described as one of the most intelligent performers. He has, you know, quite cerebral references in his stuff a lot of the time, but he is also very silly in his comedy, like he makes elaborate costumes for himself, and he has a huge range of things that he does in his shows, including poetry and showing paintings, and singing now he involves songs in the last time i saw him live a few weeks ago so it, it's always a really interesting and entertaining experience and he's just got this incredibly appealing and infectious attitude and personality so i think you're going to really enjoy this one i definitely did if you did like it please head to itunes and give us a quick star rating and or write a little review that'd be brilliant if you want to talk to us about anything you can get in touch on twitter facebook instagram snapchat IRC, any of those things. We're Hack Circus or Hack Circus Podcast on pretty much everything. Email me editor at hackcircus.com if you want to get in touch. And I'll be back on Monday with another Creativity Clinic episode. But until then, Simon Munnery. I have been a fan of your work for... I can't even look at you while I'm saying this, because I'm just... Okay, yeah, I, I I, I'm <laughs> it's of, awkward for both of us. <laughs> I know, it's terrible. But I have since I was 14, I think, when I first saw Jesus. you uh, in Edinburgh. <laughs> how how um, many years ago? <laughs> that, that was a long time ago. Okay. More, yeah, more than 20 years ago, certainly. Yeah. Wow. And anyway, relating to that, I, have a, I found a photo at the weekend which... I thought I should show you. That's me um, in the audience. Do you recognise this? <laughs> That's Klube Zarathustra. It is. Uh, wow. In, that must be uh, the Market Tavern, maybe. No, or was that in Edinburgh? It, I, see, I can't remember because I saw it twice. I think that was an Edinburgh one. Um, yeah. Oh, you know, we've got the T-shirts in Edinburgh. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's Roger Mann wearing a mask of his own face. <laughs> uh, Kevin Eldon doing a salute. Who's that next? There's Stuart. And there's um, Dave Thompson in the, I think it was pink, more pink than it looks in this picture. Leotard. What, what was, was it he red? doing in the leotard? I can't remember. A piece of performance dance. That, yeah, that. okay, yeah. Just hoovering the trains. <laughs> well, happy days. This was the first the first time I came across you. But that was as you were leaving the theatre at the end of this show, everybody was wave. Oh the waving, yes. Yeah, and dead pants. Commence things. waving. <laughs> <laughs> oh fun. It was it was so brilliant and so unlike anything I'd seen, especially at that age. Like, I think I saw it maybe when I was fourteen and when I was sixteen again. That makes sense because it was we'd we did it one year, then we did it two years later. Yeah, so it must yeah. be. Yeah. How involved were you in that? Did, was that? Was it kind of your... Because there were a lot of people in it, and it changed quite often. It changed between the shows, didn't it? But I feel like you were in both of them. Like I, I, I pretty much was. Um, well, it started off as... Um, the one year I didn't go to Edinburgh, I started a club with Roger Mann, who was wearing yeah. a mask wearing face, uh, called Clubs Out of Thuster, which we used to run at the Market Tavern, and the idea was anything other than stand-up. Didn't do like sketches either, but just what else? Could, so something not what you do at a normal gig. Yeah, that was the, the rule, and it's quite people I knew. And Roger Man was good, great friends with Kevin, and I was friends with Stuart, and he got on board. So that, those were the main four. And then Stuart got Sally Phillips on board, mm. and we had Julian Barrett, and then um, Richard Thomas, who uh, did keyboard, and Laurie Lixenberg singing opera. 
Um, and that was the, the core crew, but we had lots of guests, and, and Johnny Vegas came around a few times. So he, at, at that time, when it was, so we used to run it weekly, I think, or every two weeks. Um, I used to burn the money <laughs> at the end oh, in no. front of the performance. <laughs> Once a, a woman jumped up and tried to stop me. No, no, it's not right. It's just as a sort of piece of, I don't know, theatre, just yeah. line up all the performers and then burn the proceeds. <laughs> so then, and that's where the... Uh, I'd done the Lee against Seed and the character did before that on, mm. on my own th- the thing, but it sort of... And so I said, oh, I wanted to explore the visuals, so... I'd, Buttons and slide projectors and yeah. that sort of stuff. Then that became sort of compare that for yeah, yeah. so it became a, a kind of cabaret. The idea was to create something that we'd like to go and see. <laughs> that was yeah, that's as far as we got with it, thinking wise. And then people brought stuff along to do, and some of it stuck. Like um, Kevin Eldon's Paul Hamilton character came out of that. He, used to, okay. he always used to be this poet, and uh, he's still doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the opera singing thing did that. In some way, become Jerry Springer the opera. I feel like well, it's Richard Thomas the, the, right. and Stuart Lee wrote it, so yeah. that's how they. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But and Richard was working with Laurie doing um, combat opera, so it's basically an opera singer being extremely rude. Yes, that's the that's idea. Right. Yeah. And we use it as a sort of anti heckle device. Not that we got heckled very much, but mm-hmm. it was nice to have a few things on standby. And that was. We'd, we'd, the idea was to be able to wheel her out I mean, sing, <laughs> sing, I'm on the blob, I'm on the blob, I'm on the blob But you can take me out the shit pipe <laughs> That sort of thing um, Which, were, But that was so, there was a lot of delegations That's Richard and Laurie's thing really But, then, yeah. but we just put them in every so often Slam one of them in Mix it up a bit yeah. <laughs> A lot of people see, people come up to me um, that, that year or you know, one of those years of doing clues, People come up uh, during the festival you know, In a bar, so we're like, oh, you're a genius They go, you're a genius I uh, absolutely love that show. I love that show. I go, what do you think about the end? And they go, I didn't stay that long. <laughs> oh, no! Because <laughs> the end was never really... Never, I think that's one of them. I don't know which year it was, but it was one of them where had this Martin Stone uh, help build. Uh, the idea was to have a massive inflatable penis, the lead, swinging out over the crowd, but it never quite worked. <laughs> I mean, once it, sort of, it was quite funny, but it was... But it wasn't. It didn't look like a penis. It just looked like a huge pink tube, and the pain kept flaking off it. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of technological things we uh, got wrong. Uh, but I say, so, so people would come again and again uh, mm. those years. You know, like they kind of had a cult following, but they wouldn't necessarily stay. To the end. <laughs> there you go. It's like I got the point now. I'll just, yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I did stay to the end. I, I remember. Um, uh, we're not just going to talk about this for an hour, but I just, it's, it's so joyful to remember this. But I remember the first one, which I think I saw was at Battersea Art Centre. Oh. And I think you had, you're putting people in dunces caps and we oh, yeah. stand in the corner that? of the theatre and stuff. Yeah. It was just the most fun. Oh, the audience, didn't the audience have to wear dunces caps? Yes, yeah, yeah the yeah. audience, yeah. Yes, it was brilliant and I loved it. And thank you for it because oh, I feel like. It's my pleasure. I, I, it, was, it was a joy to do. We, really... I, we even had little cards and everything. There was so much cards. work. Yeah, I had a, I had a Card, a club Z card. Oh, it must have been what like, business or a badge or something. Yeah, all the badges, you know. I had a badge. Stuart, Stuart did all the badges and t-shirts. That's yeah. Stuart. We did a, the, the best night of it ever uh, in my memory was the night we had Ricky Grover. Do you know Ricky Grover? I think so. He used to be a boxer, became a comedian. He's oh, like, right. about six foot wide mm. and um, and very good at boxing. Mm. Uh, but uh, he's very funny as well. If you ever get a chance, Ricky Grover and a great boat. But he decided. I don't know how we asked him or he just anyway he, he was the bouncer that night for the club right it was at the Pleasance 2 and what he did was he wore a dress and he, he, he took he carried each member of the audience to their seat while whispering threats in their ear <laughs> and he's called like Cockney you know oh, more, and put each one down but the app <laughs> You know, I don't think anyone's ever done that before. <laughs> but the atmosphere that created, it was just amazing. It was just like elect- electric atmosphere. And it was just a, a really great, everything worked a great night. But um, <laughs> other times, not so good. Oh, that was such a brilliant idea, though. I, love yeah, that. I think it was his idea. Right, but, right. But it was something about the fact that he liked the show. Yeah. And he wanted to join it. And it was a great try something else. But, I, yeah, oh, yeah. For a long time, what I wanted to do was have a permanent venue for it. And I always wanted a thing of two entrances. Like, so you go, you're going to enter the show. Not enough is done with that, the entrance to a, a mm. thing. But one would, would say sheep, one would say wolves. And you just have to decide which <laughs> one you are. And if you, if you go down the sheep corridor, you end up in a long sort of pond system. 
<laughs> and eventually some tunnels and back out somewhere else when <laughs> the walls get in. Or the other way around, you could alter mm. it. But the whole idea to play around with entrances is something I wanted to do but never got around to. But, you know, it's not over yet. No, no, bring it back. Still do that somewhere. Um, there were, yeah, well, absolutely. But one of the slideshows, one of the ones I saw, it said, like, a you, and it was like a maggot, and it was like me, and it was like a lion, and it was, yeah. it was like a real kind of setting up of that with the audiences. Attention scum, you were nothing, absolutely nothing. The yeah. old superiority, yeah. That's, that's the, basically the Lee character. Yes, yeah, quite, yeah. Quite fragile. So I've done that. I did that um, <laughs> a, a, as a separate, just the Lee, but with, with Richard Thomas and Laurie Lixberg mm. as a show in Edinburgh, I don't know, two years after Club Z. Uh, or maybe I did it twice, probably. Um, and that worked. But then I did it in Melbourne, and it didn't work. It worked in Edinburgh, it worked in London. But as a beginning of a show, mm. so, something that begins... Birdie's Requiem, bang, bang, yeah, bang. Yeah. Bum, 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 bum. attention scum, you are nothing, absolutely nothing. Either you can find it funny or you're not. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm not and the character's not going to dig it back. Either you find it funny, there's, there's this absurd, puny bloke being rude to a group of people. Either you find it funny or you don't. If you take offence, you take offence, and I'm not going to dig it back. And that's why I was in Melbourne. Was it, it, was, it was kind of like you felt the audience going, been rude to us for it's something like in an English accent as well. The right. Australians got a bit of what they call the cultural cringe anyway. So it, 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 if it was an Australian voice going, attention scum, you are nothing, it's, mm. that might have been better. But but even so, so generally what happened was the first three minutes would go like go, go nothing, not only nothing, but people okay. people <laughs> the opposite of la- of laughing if there is such a thing. Sort of just just kind of annoyed. Yeah. And then a maybe dig it back a bit except one day in, in Melbourne so numbers went down down one day I, I just bizarrely just by chance I did it in this I did the characters to say camp and it was hilarious people were crying laughing on the way out I remember thinking oh I've cracked it and the next day I tried to be camp but that was awful that was worse <laughs> um, and the only other thing as the league it's been disaster wise uh, not disaster wise but it was uh, the five weeks I spent in Toronto <laughs> Where just the went down and down until one. It was this bloke who was, uh, he wanted to uh, be a theatrical producer, he was an accountant, but he decided by his 30th birthday he wanted to produce a show. So he picked Dave Gorman out of the brochure, but he wasn't available, so then he picked me from a video brochure of some sort. And I thought I was going to Toronto Festival. I was saying to people in Edinburgh, you going to Toronto Festival? I had never heard of it. Anyway, I got there, it's just me <laughs> for five weeks uh, in this big theatre that had been unused for five years, and they. And there's two bar staff and a follow spot operator and stage manager. And on one of the matinees, there were three people in the audience. Right? And I'm banging out to the whole room. Again, it's the same thing. The Canadians, well, attention scum, you're nothing. If you don't find that funny, the rest of the show's <laughs> I've got to dig it back. Um, uh, anyway, three people till half time, the interval. Had my customary half time beer. I came back on and oh, I was doing it again, sort of to the whole room. And Hold on, something's changed. Two people have gone. <laughs> it's just you. Five <laughs> empty no. theatre. Oh. But he laughed all the way through. That bloke, with a, he had a beard, I remember. But so it was, you did the whole show to one guy. Yeah, I did, I did forty-five minutes to one guy in a five hundred seat theatre. I mean, no, you could do forty-five minutes to one person. It's, it's, but there's something. It's, it's so absurd. But once you've been through that, I, I don't. You know, I, I can't really fear small audiences yes, yeah. in the same way I used to. But it get quite interested in what, uh, when an audience breaks down. Um, Eugene Cheese used to run the Chuckle Club, London's longest-running comedy club, till it closed. But uh, he would always cancel a gig for less than 30 people. That was his magic number. Mm. And I've run clubs, I wouldn't, you know, like six, seven, eight. Yeah. I think he's got a point. About 30, something happens to a group of people about 30 in number. Mm. It's uh, above that. You know, it can go well, a show with less than 30 people, but there's something like a small number of people feels awkward as being an audience, where the larger the number... The more we feel more comfortable with those I think it's not a coincidence that 30 is Eugene Cheese's minimum size for an audience, and it's also most teachers do the maximum size for a class. Something happens about the number 30 around there. Yeah, it's not science, but I find that, that coincidence intriguing. I think it's good to. You know you're doing something a bit exciting, though, I think. You're yeah. really alienating audiences. Like. <laughs> there is something about that. There is something about oh, when it's going really badly, you, you know you're onto something. You know, when it's, uh, it's, it's terrible, it's uh, probably an inch away from me. Brilliant. There's, um, I won't name it, there's, a, there's an axe, sort of half naked bloke with a keyboard. Pretty strange stuff. And I saw him one night, 
and he just stormed it. It was just hilarious, absolutely hilarious. I saw him doing the same act about two nights later, and there's another comic standing next to me, and he went, what the fuck is this? In, in a kind of angry, like, what the fuck? I said, the thing is, like, I saw him two nights, like, I accept this isn't going well. Like, it doesn't seem funny in any way. I saw exactly the same thing two nights ago, be hilarious. And there's two ways of saying, what the fuck is this? Is, what what the fuck is this? slightly angry about it all. I kind of wonder, what the fuck? <laughs> this? Mm. And they're, they're quite close to each other, really. Mm. It's the same words, and that's not a coincidence. It's exciting when you divide a crowd. I was in Newcastle doing a preview this a couple of years ago, and it, it, that's what was in my diary, preview, right. Newcastle, middle of July. And what I use previews for is start with nothing. Mm. Um, you know, it's going to be rough. <laughs> something will, at the end of the month of August, something will have fallen out, and we'll call that a show. Yeah. But um, uh, good previews, I'm not guaranteeing anything. It is. That's why it says preview on it. Mm. Um, but it wasn't built as it. I saw I got that on the big poster. It's just Simon Murray and some like funnier than bread or something. Some yeah. like yeah, you know, <laughs> the best thing you'll ever see kind of quotation. Yeah. And no, no mention of preview anywhere. Mm. And they've got a load of people in. So about 60, 80 people. But uh, but it's too long. Oh, that's the show's called Simon Munnery sings Soren Kierkegaard. So I was going to be <laughs> attempting to perform bits of Soren Kierkegaard writing <laughs> to these people. And um, I was about asking for your money back. <laughs> people started. I explained. I don't think this is going to go very well. And indeed, I lived up to that prophecy. But people were just in ones and twos going. Right, you know, he's reading out old chunks of gig on. Just, just to see what, oh, what good possible. And they, they start all go. This woman stopped and said, uh, you, you've, got to, you've got to change your act. People are leaving in droves. I said, what's some twos, madam? Not droves. <laughs> <laughs> but she wanted her money back. But my thing, thought about that is, uh, that's not how money works. <laughs> I'd, I'd like my money back. But, you know, it's, not, it's always a gamble. It, it's, always, it's, it's people who shout out who ruin a show and then want their money back, mm. whereas it should be the rest of the audience get their money back yeah. from the people that ruin the show. Yes, yeah. That would the hecklers shouldn't be entitled to money back. That's, that's my view. Yeah, on the, on the subject of sort of doing unprepared shows, do you, you, you seem to have, like, a huge amount of material always in your head, like... Just kind of from a lifetime of performing. I, I suppose I've got a back catalogue. It's amazing how they can go out of your head <laughs> <laughs> at any given moment. But yes, but no, what I sort of tend to do is like a show, like even the show you saw has changed since then. I've, I've yeah. been, been to Bristol and uh, got a new anecdote which goes to a whole new area. At some point, you, maybe that bit will become part of another show. But, um, I like that they're kind of a collage of things that you just kind of, you're like, yes. I'm, I'm passionate about this or I think this is really funny, so yep. I'm going to share it. So it, it. Passionate about it or makes me laugh. Yeah. Um, so, and also then I was forced to do uh, some venues, they, they like you to have an interview. Yeah, there was an interval and it was very strange and you were sort of watching your, I think you were watching um, one well, weird over and then, yeah. What happens now is the, the alarm goes off, I go, oh, it's the interval. Because it was an hour, an hour show, yeah. I remember that's the slot format, yeah. and now it's two... <laughs> A 45 and a 40. Yeah. It's expanded to fill uh, quite a bit. And now, so I've finished that leg of the tour, and now January will start again. Right. right. And, uh, but, but it's nice to, oh, another little thing occurs. I can, I've got somewhere to put it. Yeah. But then there'll come a point where you know, throw it all away and start again. Do you get bored of stuff when you've done it quite a few times, or do you go, that's still good, I'll come back to that? Oh, no, if, if I say a thing, I love saying it. So, um, <laughs> it, you know, it, it's more when it gets to the point you've done it so often you can't you can't do it anymore so that happens and if you leave them fallow for about seven years you can do them again <laughs> that, that's my theory <laughs> next generation well, yes exactly it's not even, and also you, you make a sort of rule for yourself every year Edinburgh, it's all got to be new well, John Hickley says you know it's, it, it, who made that rule it's not necessarily true if you like doing something so for the, this year's show I sing a couple of do I do two songs yeah yeah, yeah. And I've, I've really enjoyed just getting better. At, well, I don't know, I'm getting better, but, but doing every show, I sing that song, and I'm coming to it, and I know there's going to be no laughs, and that doesn't matter. <laughs> it's yeah, all right. Yeah. It you don't, if you're filling 245s, it doesn't have to be punchline, 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 yeah. like they used to say on there. Yeah. You need a bit of light and shade. I like singing that song, both those songs. I'm, I'm going to sing them, and um, perhaps I'll get more stuff will come out of it, you don't know. Mm. It's not, you said about just putting on a show, there's nothing like doing something to find out how to do it the next time. Or I like that sense of learning to do a thing by doing it yeah, yeah. as opposed to going on a course or book learning <laughs> no it's nothing wrong with books it's the internet <laughs> <laughs> you're saying it's changed a lot or, or 
it takes shape a lot more since I saw it. I, I like the sort of the shapelessness of it, I think. Oh, no, it's still the same. I still don't have a running order right. or anything, or, <laughs> or no one really next. I know there's certain things. I've only got the pegs there. I'll do the pegs a bit, maybe. Uh, but if something <laughs> occurs to me, I can, I, I can go... Uh, I have the potential to improvise, and sometimes I do, but not, not very often. Mm. But it... I like the looseness of it. Basically, it's a vehicle for me to say whatever I want. Mm. That's how I like to think of it. And um, just got to hope there'll be some last along the way. And fortunately, usually it turns out there are. And, and enough people come to make it financially worthwhile doing oh, it. Just about. You know, just scraping a living. But it's mm. all right. I'm, not, I'm very lucky to be able to do something I love. I've done something I love for so long and scraped a living. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Have you ever thought about doing anything else? Did you have a job at any point? I say a job, I, but in I have, I have had jobs. I mean, years and years ago, I used to be as a computer programmer. Well, between the ages of 13 and 16, gave it up. Um, used to write games for a company in Liverpool called Bug When you were 13, you wrote... Between 13 and 16. As a job? Yeah, well, I started off just... So we got a ZX80. Yeah. And... Um, started writing games, wrote into magazines, and they yeah. published them. Yeah. And they got contacted by a company in... Um, Wales called Abacus Software said, would you like to write a, a, a game for us and we'll give you a royalty so that, that's like that and Bug Bite uh, big little company was like, you know write uh, um, like a, a version of um, Scrambles an arcade game yeah. for the Commodore Vic 20 you, so I wrote that and then it was, it was you know you can get royalty or we'll buy you out for 800 quid and I started going skiing when I was <laughs> 40 <laughs> Uh, on, wow. my, on my uh, with my money, I was sort of independently wealthy. <laughs> no, a car, or anything. but um, by about seven, 16, 17, I got really fed up with closeness to the screen and mm. kind of all the summers I'd missed. Well, I don't know, not summer, <laughs> but just, uh, just, uh, I don't know. If it, but I was invited to to go up and um, you know live and work in Liverpool at sixteen, mm. uh, and I went up for a meeting, and uh, that turned me off. No, it was quite <laughs> run down Liverpool for those days. And anyway, I wanted to go to. College. I'd be all the way through school. It's wait to get to college. So mm. I made. It, I'm going to carry on with my education. Yeah. But I, mean, I could always come back to. But it was right at the boom time and all that. So I started that. Um, my dad's a plumber. I used to help him. I worked as a security guard, a road sweeper. I, the worst job. Well, second worst was um, worked in a factory in, in Watford, which was making components for gas stoves. But anyway, my job was this: to put these metal things in this machine, get the guard out way and go put it in then do the next one just by hand and it's a very unfriendly place uh, no one spoke to me at all I was clearly a student you know temp, temporary student worker until I'd been there about two weeks most mind numbing if you make a mistake you'll lose your hand but that's all <laughs> mind numbingly yeah. dull and um, the only human contact I was, it was clock in clock out so uh, how are you getting on so well a bit boring. <laughs> he goes, try doing it all your life. <laughs> Walks <laughs> off. Like, oh God. Oh, I'm so sorry to. Uh, oh, you know, you think you've got, yeah. I fell into that trap. Uh, but the worst job I had was um, as a temp. So one uh, with an agency in Watford. I used to uh, just uh, to pay off my debt after leaving college was. Um, so, because I could type, I'd be one day I'd be in a typing pool mm. doing data entry or something. Another day I'd be uh, road sweeping for the council. But this job was um, to clean out the coal bunkers at Rolls Royce. It's now uh, Leesden, what's it called? Studios where the Harry Potter experience is. Oh, yeah, yeah. But back then it was a huge factory, and what they did, they had enormous screws that drove this coal from the bunker into the furnace to, for whatever they did with it. I don't know. But if those ever got jammed, then the coal had to be dug out from the bunker. Right? And uh, the, the blokes that worked there would, would be sitting around drinking cups of tea, watching me and this other young guy wearing white overalls, in intense heat, in a coal bunker, with a little mask on, just digging coal all day for, for less than they were getting for watching us drinking tea. <laughs> uh, that was the worst job. 
I'm quite intrigued by the, um, the ZX80 programming, though. I hosted an event a few years ago at the BFI for 30 years of the ZX Spectrum. I wish I'd known I should have been there. I, I know. I, wish I'd, I probably could have booked you for it, to be fair. You could. <laughs> well, next time. I'm, yeah, um, maybe I'm, 40 I'm, years. <laughs> I'm actually fluent in 6502 and ZATA machine Are code. Are you? 6502. Yeah. And they, they say... language, very they, versatile. They say Latin is a dead language. I know. They do. 652 simple uh, was um, ZATA, which is what the spectrum had, was uh, you, could do, you could do add HL, or a, a 16-bit number you could add together, which had, it was simpler in 6502. But that makes you find you know, new techniques to do. With, it's like the, what's it called? REM, reduced instruction set. Mm. They came up with later. Like, you could have a bigger instruction set, makes it a bit slower, which you know, for some reason, or a small instruction set and long, faster, but you need more program to do whatever it is you want to do. Mm. I, I suppose that's the eternal dilemma for computer designers. Fortunately, I'm not one. Oh, you should be. <laughs> As I should. This episode of Hack Circus is sponsored by James Jeffrey's company Shed Code. James and I were residents at the Site Gallery in 2012 as part of the Happenstance project. We had fun working with tweeting, printers and drawing machines and we got involved with Bill Drummond's exhibition, which was great fun. Amazing bloke. Anyway, not as amazing as James Jeffries. James is interested in collaborating on interesting projects. He specialises in doing stuff with data and he's recently been working with the Bureau of Investigative Journalism building an API for their crowdsourced data on drone strikes, BBC R&D, creating interactive stories on the Taster platform and the London Philharmonic Orchestra creating searchable archive of their historic performances so if you'd like to hire him or have a chat about anything really you can send him an email at james at shedcode.co.uk or find him on twitter at james jeffries j-e-f-f-e-r-i-e-s note the unusual spelling of jeffries right let's get back to the show Yeah, I, I guess one thing that a lot of people say about you is that you are an artist comedian. You must have heard this. No, do you, well, oh, really? Well, do you feel like that? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like that description, but I don't get a grant of any kind. So that's, that's <laughs> the big difference between being... I have, and yeah. failed to get it. Um, okay. Not for any reason. They, they, they were kind enough to say, just they didn't have any more money. Oh. <laughs> no, I applied through uh, Arts Council. And it was a whole thing, and they did all the forms they helped with for doing La, La Concepta, this restaurant thing I did. And you go through all that palaver, and then it doesn't come off. It's just sort of... But it was ex- how I came to do that was because they invited me down to talk to some artists about comedy and how perhaps they could use comedy in their art or something. Right. And what kind of struck me is, while describing my life and career, that I'd been doing art for all these years, but not... No chance of getting sponsored in the sort of rough commercial environment. I take artistic risks and that's my income going down, you know. So I, a kind of anger about that, about that, whether I... But, I, you know, I'm happy enough with comedian, but um, I'm probably on the art side of that, I'd hope. Yeah, I mean, what, what I've always noticed is that you always... Well, two things, I suppose. One is that you always make things like either you produce your paintings or you wear something that you've made and it just it's so lovely and unusual and the other thing I noticed which isn't directly related to being an artist but I meant to say earlier is that you involve the audience quite a lot which but in kind of a not in a threatening way usually it's quite nice and collaborative I mean they're there (laughs) (laughs) I mean John Hegley's the the master he's brilliant it's just it's about creating an atmosphere and getting people together I mean that's what one thing about laughter is you share a laugh like a group of people share a laugh when an audience all laugh as one I always, I always liken that as to when a, when a flock of birds arc as though by central command. There's something magical about it. It's beautiful. That's, that's the hook that keeps you on going back to the stage. You know, I, six months off once, when I, was, I had nerve damage, I was on morphine, and I had to cancel a gig at the Frog and Bucket in Manchester. Uh, well, not cancel, no, they, they said, uh, do you mind not going on last tonight? <laughs> we'll pay you the same money. But, uh, yeah, for, uh, when you're on morphine, you're kind of uh, numb. You know, not really should be on stage so I had six months off I didn't think anything about it till halfway through that six months I was meant to do Melbourne 
International Comedy Festival. I thought, yeah, that'll, that'll be fine. Lovely, love going in there. And they had a big gala, radio gala, 500 seat theatre. And I was doing five minutes, you know, a lot of extra. Room. I was about to go and look. What? <laughs> why would you? Why would you want to stand up in front of five hundred people and speak? What an embarrassing, <laughs> embarrassing job! Oh God! Anyway, I went on. It went fine. Straight back in. But uh, but it's a sort of it's one of the little things I do in Edinburgh. I've noticed that I do. Uh, probably a lot of other people. I take as many gigs as I can. So rather than go down that sort of adrenaline, lack of adrenaline. Recover dread when you're just when you're just nervous the whole time. There's no, um, yeah. it, it, you don't even notice it. If you do four or five gigs in a day, by the fifth one, it's, you're immune to it until September comes and you fall off a cliff and kind of uh, get ill, go dizzy for a bit. But I, I, I find it, you know, it's like it's my equi- equivalent of the Olympics or some sporting thing. Yes, yeah. Some sporting event. <laughs> Yeah, the AGM thing that you do. Do you do, you do that every year in Edinburgh? I, did do that every year. I thought we'd get funnier. Then? I did stop here. Oh. Yeah. oh no, I used to love that because it, it is very audience based as well. Which is oh yeah, the whole. Point. I forced myself. I thought I will not. I, I, I've got stuff I'll do, and I, you know I won't improvise. When, I'll force myself to do it. So, I'm, so the first one was just hand out you know motions from the audience, and I'll discuss them. Mm. And it. You know, I, Seven, ten, fifteen, twenty people in. You know, I was enjoying doing it. It's going all right, building up slowly. And then uh, uh, the, the next day it was full, one hundred and fifty people. Uh, three o'clock. Uh, oh, uh, and I panicked a bit. I just thought they all gave motions in. I had one hundred and fifty bits of paper to get through, so I was basically just reading them out and going, oh, I don't know, uh, next one. So, <laughs> uh, and what had happened was it'd been. Uh, re- it'd been reviewed and there was, it got a five star review from someone seeing it when there were about 20 people in and it was fun and it was time to go through them all and it was uh, and then the very fact that so the people there were A, five star review hunters who were the a worst kind of audience because they can never experience what the five star review writer experienced because yeah. to them it was a surprise they know it's going to be good so it can't anyway at, what, during the gig one of them held up my own review at me like like um, I was Dracula and it was some garlic <laughs> uh, I'd go Oh, and it blow. Oh, yeah, well, it's not going so well today. And, so, and there were another reviewer was in that day, and then he got a two-star review saying, basically what he does, he, he gets the audience to write things down, then he reads them out. That's not a show. <laughs> but it's sort of balanced out over, I don't know, about six years. I just thought the title would get funnier, and it would reaching, but I don't think it did. And then uh, after a while... Oh, the other problem I smelled of that was... I, I felt obliged to go through all the motions that, that had yeah. been... been Otherwise, I, if I was there, I'd feel slightly short-changed. But what I realised, the time, the show doesn't have to end when the time slot ends. The time slot is for the venue, mm. and after that, it used to be fun. We used to go to an art gallery or the park or yeah, someone's gallery. Yeah, the audience with yeah. you and go, let's yeah. go to the and then we'll, yeah. until we go through. And sometimes it went on for three or four hours <laughs> before we'd done them all. <laughs> and, you know, and the audience, obviously, people would dwindle away. Be, yeah. Sometimes just me and Mac. Uh, and then one year we did. We, after, you know, as part of it, we went to Arthur Smith at an art gallery. We went there and played pool and chess at the same time while dealing with motions. <laughs> <laughs> so a combined game of chess and pool. Anyway, lots of things we've uh, tried and failed. Try, try again and fail better. Obviously, as a child, going to see um, these at Club Zarathustra shows, I remember the reviews said, oh, it's, a da- it's like a Dada cabaret. Like, that was how it was always described. And I didn't know what that meant until years later when I started reading about Dada for my university degree and stuff and, uh, and just some of the descriptions of the things that those guys did I thought fuck yeah that's, exact, that's a really good description for that thing I saw it was like a, a little girl will meet you in an abandoned car park rehearsing profound poetry and lead you through the building to where the show's happening and things like that that's the Dada yeah, yeah. Also, I also like the um, I mean to, uh, to make me laugh Italian futurists um, yes, Marinetti yeah, yeah. with their I love a manifesto. Yes. With a, um, <laughs> we sing the we sing the beauty of speed. And at the time, they were driving around in cars that went at twenty miles an hour, <laughs> and they all went off. And it, the beauty of war, the only hygiene of the world. But then, uh, and what you, it's very hard to, to gauge from this 
distance in time. It's how serious they were. I mean, I find it hilarious, but, and I think they must have known slightly that they were being hilarious, but also I think they were serious, to the extent that they all believed in speed and war as the late hygiene, and they, went up, they joined the bicycle regiment, I believe, most of them, the Italian futurists, and went off and got, you know, killed yeah. in, the, in the First World War. Uh, you know, put their money with the mouthpiece. But they could still have been joking. They designed a suit for beating up critics, to, to wear to beat up critics. I mean, <laughs> the, just the very fact of having done that. Like, I find that a hilarious joke. Uh, there's loads of um, avant-garde art groups, but, mm. yeah, I don't, yeah. Did you read about them before you started doing your stuff, or do you feel like... About, you... about the age of 19, yeah. I was introduced to lots of things by my friend, uh, Stephen Cheek, who's, um, my, who's, who's in a double act with him, but he, he's, you know, Nietzsche and um, Kierkegaard and Bob Dylan, The Clash and uh, Dada, The Surrealists, uh, just sort of, you know, mm-hmm. a taste, and I sort of investigated it on my own and libraries and we just get excited by that sort of thing but then not much happened for years later until uh, I think Stuart as well was, was, was pretty keen on that sort of thing you don't know it's not like I studied that and then tried to recreate it it was no, more like sure. I want we wanted we all wanted it's just something exciting and fun to come when Clubs of the Thousand was a club we had a band called Evangelista it was an indie band what I insisted was each one of them was in a different corner so it was quadraphonic sound depending <laughs> where you were in the room if you were near the bass that's all you'd hear <laughs> A lot of fun. Oh, I've always liked making things. Yeah. You uh, mentioned your shed in the show. You've got a crafting a shed that you I make do, stuff It's in. disgusting, yeah. but yes, I do. Have shed. It's a lot. It's just a, a stack of half-finished tasks uh, and cider cans. <laughs> but um, yeah, I do make make these. Uh, I'm make, making something at the moment, which I've been working on. I used, to, I used to be about the show I used to describe this thing and enough people came up and said no you should actually do that <laughs> uh, that is actually a very very good idea the thing in the uh... <laughs> well no, it's actually a, a, something with practical and possibly even commercial use but uh, I've just been working on it slowly and at the moment I'm on the stage of putting off doing it so I, I know exactly what I want to do it's quite hard physically I've got to bend some pipe right, um, so, yeah. and I brought my dad's pipe benders so I'm ready and I've, I've made a, a really bad version of it uh, I just went straight in, did it, and I, 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 it's got to be better than that. Uh, and I'm ready to go and sit, but it's just wait, waiting there. And then I, oh, maybe I should wash up, you know, <laughs> or uh, do an email backlog or something. But maybe tonight I'll get home and I'll feel like it. I proceed very slowly. I do like making things. I think, I think it's a good thing. And repairing as well. Right. I don't like destroying or throwing away. They're the things I, <laughs> I don't like. Are you good at fixing things, like oh. cars? Oh. Yeah, um, clothes, um, houses. I imagine you're good at making clothes. Like, there's lots of um, jackets. I, I'm too. I've a partial use of my left hand, so I'm not particularly good at sewing. I can work a sewing machine, so I do. I did actually for that that show. I did make some. I converted some jeans to gold flares, like uh, like Elvis, but they, <laughs> they proved really uncomfortable. So I stopped wearing them. Uh, so I do make clothes, but mainly things. Uh, but repairing things, anything like this morning, I fixed my youngest daughter's roller skates. So the brake had come off. In order to put the brake back on, you'd take the whole thing apart because the, the, the right. nut was left yeah. in a rattling around. Anyway, I used to uh, take things apart and put them back together when I was a child. I'd always have more bits left over. I mean, it worked very well with the radio, less so with my sister. <laughs> um, <laughs> I haven't got a sister anymore. anymore. No. <laughs> Just bits. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it, it yeah, and and then that makes me think of the programming stuff again. And like a lot of, I mean, I end up knowing a lot of programmers, and they they love taking things apart and putting them back together. And there's that sort of because I think people would think that a kind of lightning bolt of inspiration hits you and you just create something out of the blue and it's madness, which is what it looks like when you you know come up with stuff. But maybe there's more of a methodical thing going on. If you or do you, I don't know. I, I think if what. what one, I'm not saying I am, but what one calls a genius is, is really servant of an idea. They say it's nice percent, one percent, something rather. It's inspiration. It's an inspiration perspiration yes. combo. Um, so, but I think that absolutely, when something strikes you, uh, it feels like it, could, it doesn't feel like you thought of it. It's like it feels like it is like it's a gift from above or, or something. You go, oh yeah, like the penny drops and that, that joy, and then you're obliged to do something with it. Uh, at the very least, tell someone. But actually, can it be pursued? You know what? So that, 
that's when the problem solving part of it and the putting some effort in comes. I don't mind a bit of, particularly my shit, I don't mind a bit of chaos. You see something, oh, well, maybe those to go together. That's how David Bowie used to write his lyrics. I mean, he used to throw, write them all, individual lines, and throw them up and see where it landed. Is that true? Well, I believe so. But, um, it's, it's, you know, it's print the myth, really. I think that, that's, yeah. that's quite a viable, you know, not viable, a valid, no, not even that word, um, <laughs> uh, possible technique. It depends what comes out at the, the end of it. You, you know, you, you spot things. But a, a, little, a little bit of chaos is good. Too much chaos? I don't know. Uh, a little bit of chaos Star helps. reviews in the Scotsman. Yeah. All in all, a piss poor hour long show. Oh, is that what they actually said? No. Uh, that was another review. So oh, I've, I've, I've had them all over the years. Stick in your head, don't they? <laughs> I remember that line. All in all, a piss poor hour long show. It's quite nicely That's the last rhythmic. One. Yes, it's good. <laughs> okay, next one to review. You need a critic bashing suit or whatever it is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could totally make one for the next no. show. I did try I bribed a journalist once to give me a, a zero stars review <laughs> but, um, and she did but, uh, but it didn't come out in time but five pounds just, I was so drunk we were wasting money bravado it would have actually it would have been awful <laughs> it would have been less people coming you know I've got children to feed On the subject of your children, um, I just kind of want you to recount this story that you told in the show about your daughter and an apple. So she's kind of hair, she's only young, well, but getting older, and uh, it's like hair and makeup and looking at herself in the mirror and tightening herself up the whole time. Like, ah, too soon, too soon. Uh, so I did a little trick on her. There's an apple tree outside the garden in June. The apples weren't ripe, there's these small green apples. I went out and, and put two little arms made out of wire and cardboard in one of the apples. One arm purportedly showing a, holding a paintbrush uh, with red at the end. Uh, and I painted half the apple red, as if the apple had painted itself red. <laughs> and then the other arm was holding a little sign saying, Eat me now. And I took my eldest daughter and said, Oh, it's a lovely sunny day, isn't it? Isn't it lovely? Yeah, yeah. Look at the apples. They're not ripe, not ripe at all. Look at that foolish apple there. And, and she laughed, but it hasn't changed her behaviour in any way. <laughs> um, so we, we understand each other anyway. <laughs> Do you actually worry? Is, is this kind of the comic effect, or is it something you are a bit concerned about? Like your daughter's growing up. Yeah, I, I just, every morning she has to uh, spend ages look, doing makeup. I don't think you kind of. I don't know how to express it really, but you're kind of uh, part of your own impression. If, if you wear makeup, then the next girl has to wear makeup, and all girls have to wear makeup because you're, you're, you're sort of raising that. And who's it for? You know, my constant battle I have with I was talking about phones. I say, I don't think you should take a phone to school. I mean, in my day, I can't remember, if someone came to school with what equivalent of a phone, which mm. would be uh, a camera, a Walkman, uh, a publication system, yeah. <laughs> like, a recording device, like, all those different... You just wouldn't be allowed. This is what, you know, that, but, oh, a phone. They're kind of essential. And in some lessons, the teacher actually confiscates the phones, puts them in a box and lets them have back at the end. You have to go through that plot. I think the school should ban them. I don't think you should... I don't see why phone, uh, the whole phone thing. But anyway, she sneaks it out. Sometimes I, I catch her and I'm trying to what have you done with your phone. Um, and also, you know, the difference between a phone and, say, a tablet or using the computer is that, you know, she can, uh, it's, kind of, it's got a code, passcode, so she can be secret about it. Or, what, who are you doing? But the hair and the makeup, that's every day. Like, so I go, look, can you get your hair out of your face? Like, before you, you go, right down here there. Yeah, if we got on the bus, can you get her? She puts it on. <laughs> puts the hairband on. She gets on the bus and I'm watching it as she's going, she's taking her hairband out. <laughs> and it's still over and starts wobbling it around. Oh, oh. Anyway, um, I'm sure she'll find her husband, but hopefully not so soon. <laughs> she, just wait a little. There'll be others. <laughs> Don't jump on the first bus. Anyway. But you were, you were in full-time employment at 13, so maybe she's yes. kind of looking to you as her inspiration for growing up too soon. But no, I, I, I appreciate... It was at school as well. It was, okay. like, it was a hobby. Right, right. Uh, just a yeah. you know, uh, financially uh, lucrative mm-hmm. hobby at the time. Who was it said? If you don't shout at your children, you're not spending enough time with them. Who <laughs> 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 said that? I got not my other favourite children quotation is um, President Truman said, I found the best way to give advice to my children is to find out what they want to do and advise them to do it. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favourite 
piece of work that you've done out of all the many and varied things that you've done over the years? I was really pleased with La Concepta, the um, conceptual restaurant for eight people. But I was interested in wh- whether what happens when an audience works when it's not an audience. Is there any way of performing to small numbers of people and, and it work as a show? Because if you stand up with a mic in front of four people, that's just mm. that's embarrassing for everyone. So it's a, it's a conceptual restaurant. It's a restaurant with no food. The tagline to it is La Concepta, her all the rigmarole of out cuisine without the shame of eating. <laughs> all the shame of out cuisine without the rigmarole of eating. If you, anyway, so I play various different characters. The maitre d' becomes the waiter. But, uh, but the awkwardness of the situation, we are used to sitting, well, a lot of people anyway, are used to sitting around a table at a restaurant right, and someone serving you and asking you questions. We're used to that format. So it's less embarrassing than sitting four of you in, with someone performing it when they're seemingly individually asking things in the restaurant format mm. then it we can relax even though there's, and it, there's hilarity if there's no food and um, in, on our plates we serve art so each each dish is a me- <laughs> so go through the whole you know the, the format well like a format menu starter main dessert that format and just lots of different dishes and each dish is a, a sort of a thing or a performance attached to it <laughs> fitted into a suitcase and um, it, for a month at a disused shop in Carnaby Street which we rented uh, and I do it, but in order to make it economically viable I do it five times a day so it's a 45 minute show ten minutes to set it all up again oh they're outside bang eight people at a time and what I was amazed by that was that it generally worked so eight out of ten were good one out of ten would be brilliant and one out of ten would be bad but, but that, there is a fragility to eight people it depends on those eight people if one of them's an attention focus pulling twat from America um, like that tall bloke was uh, it's, it's ten- or they could all be very shy in little clumps and, and not sort of bond together but uh, I, I was amazed how, how well that went as well because you wouldn't before I did that I wouldn't have thought that would have worked I tried that because I thought maybe that will work and I thought I would like to see more of this you could have a field full of uh, fake restaurants I quite like to see a festival like that which is no amplification so you could have without no noise beats you could have quite small performances in small tents something like that I'd like to see someday And that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed listening as much as I enjoyed making that episode. Don't forget to go to iTunes and do a quick rating if you get a chance. If you hate iTunes, then just tell someone about the show. And I'll be back on Monday for the Creativity Clinic episode and Thursday again for the next interview. So hope you're enjoying these. Do get in touch and let me know what you think anytime. Always great to hear from you. And I'll see you soon. <laughs> <laughs>